Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome back on Ike's Racing, Marco from Monza speaking. Welcome in the eye corner as you have seen maybe in a previous video, but today as you can see the theme of the video is not the eye corner but is the theme named stories, a sort of big umbrella where I would like to tell some stories about motorsport, racing etc that are not let's say tributes or dramas or uh, nostalgic things but just something especially in this case for European viewers regarding the world of open wheel racing in America in the United States that uh, really did hit me like a punch in my face and uh, obviously can be just my passion my curiosity but I hope to share with you some nice things and this video very likely will uh, explain in some way what I did recently with my channel, racing three races of this IndyCar Racing 2 Indy Racing League 96 season that I've tried to explain in some way, maybe in the first video, but that I wanted deeply exploit together with you to be sure to have, let's say, a complete storytelling that I think I've missed and that maybe I should have done before the start of the IRL 96 season raced with IndyCar Racing 2. Anyway, you are more than welcomed. I hope to find you very well and I hope that this presentation will uh, leave you with some insights, with some notes that will make you passionate like I have become for the world of American open wheel racing. And so the title of this story is The Split, that is a motorsport story narrated by myself. And so, with the name of the split, we can start to have a little presentation that has an agenda where with nine points I will try to explain everything around it. Let's start with the first. So, what is the split? As you can read on screen, is a complete separation. It happened in 1996, but it had a sort of prequel that even if we don't want to compare properly the two things, it's like when we talk about the First World War that created some problems unresolved that then did lead to the Second World War. But to afford it, to face it, we have to do also a little summary. First of all, between the start of the last century and the half part of the last century, everything about racing in US was basically managed by the American Automobile or Automobile Association. It was a sort of FIA for us as Europeans. But after the tragedy of the 24 hours of Le Mans of the 1955, where 83 spectators were killed in a car crash that maybe you have seen in the tribute I did for Mike Hawthorne, the AAA Association said, OK, it's time for us to give up and we will not be again included into motorsport because motorsport is too dangerous and does not translate our values into our everyday job. So they quit and in 55 was born another sanctioning body that was the United States Auto Club with this logo that maybe you recognize and being founded in 55 from 56 to 78 organized the American open wheel racing seasons. It was also a sort of recognized arm of the FIA for the US interest and was quite a big name to play a role in the organization of championships, races, etc. But then there is a third era, a third scenario that from 79 to 95 the championship auto racing teams, CART for short, organization took over the management of the American Opel Wheel Racing Series, taking it from the USAC FIA organized management. Taking over from the previously USAC FIA organized sanctioning body, becoming a sort of independent organization. We are going to see it in a more, let's say, deep way, because this story is about the year 1996, but has some before and after. So on top of the screen, we keep in mind which are the three major scenarios, eras in the American environment, and we put some points on the table. 
Let's start with the first. The term IndyCar name takes its name from the, let's say, Indianapolis 500 miles race, because the car racing at, in at Indianapolis were the Indy type car. Even if at the beginning they were named Champ Car, but because at the end the common uh, usage of the name was IndyCar, they have become IndyCar, with a strong relationship with the Indianapolis Motor Speedway circuit and also with the type of race held there. Behind the formation of the USAC sanctioning body, there was Mr. Tony Hullman, that was also the owner of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. And so let's say there was a man and a board of directors directly involved in the most important race for every year of the American racing series, but also the organizers of the rest of the championship. Mr. Tony Holman, I think, can be related like, if not Enzo Ferrari, let's say Bernie Eccleston, for his skills and capabilities of organizing people, talking with vendors, uh, with teams, with drivers, I mean, was really a master of communication and organization. And his organization led to an incredible growth of the, let's say, IndyCar series, for simplify things, that between 56 and 78 has seen an incredible growth, an incredible popularity, thanks to the work done by Mr. Holman. And it was not only something about the Indianapolis 500 or the IndyCar series, because also the subcategories, the feeder categories regarding races over dirt and paved ovals were absolutely at the top of their popularity in that period. And all of this happened also in the 60s, where if you remember in Formula One, but not only in Formula One, also in US, there was the strong transition between front mounted engines and rear mounted engines that anyway changed also the world of uh, motorsport also in US, not only in Europe. Plus there was also the start of the addition of some non-oval races into the championship. Up to the 1970 included, the IndyCar championship, if we can call it this way, was uh, an overall series of races, both on ovals, made by asphalt, by pavement, or as a dirt oval type, that they were all contributing to the final championship rankings for drivers and teams. But the organization, the USAC, decided, okay, from now onwards, the IndyCar series will be held on ovals and some road races, but not anymore on dirt ovals that will belong to a feeder different category. And it is also in this period, in the 70s, that the same thing happened between Formula One and IndyCar series. Some teams were very successful and they have become, let's say, more powerful from a performance and political and economical point of view. In Formula One we had Lotus, McLaren, Tyrrell and Ferrari, obviously, being the only real constructor, if you like. In US it happened the same thing, not anymore just with cars builders or engine builders, but with private teams like Tim Penske, Pat Patrick, Dan Garney's team and McLaren. But it is also in this period where some uh, discussions very hard happened between uh, team owners and USAC as a sanctioning body organization because for some teams the TV coverage, the media coverage were not, let's say, enough to guarantee more incomes also to the teams, where the main event was still the Indy 500, but in some way for many teams was not enough to continue in a profitable way. And it is in this period that came out the white paper written by Dan Garney that generated, let's say, a sort of real split real first split, a sort of first world war that characterizes this story. Together with this, there is also a tragic scenario where Mr. Tony Holman unluckily dies in the 77 and after his death, a plane crash did kill eight key members, eight directors and managers of the USAC organization, leaving the organization in a sort of chaos and a sort of not easily recoverable, disorganized board members. This also influenced a lot what was the point of view of the most famous and winning teams of the IndyCar that were more or less, let's say, feeling lost and not heard 
by the organization. And so with the white paper of Dan Garney, that was, let's say, the voice, the main voice of all the teams, at the end, the team owners of the IndyCar most successful teams decided to split with the USAC and started to create a series owned and managed by the same participants of the series, so let's say a sort of independent move that created what was the kart championship, even if the Indy 500 remained as the most important race of the nation under the USAC controlling body. And here is where the war starts, because in 79 the USAC said you as kart teams cannot participate to the Indy 500 of the 1979. Luckily or unluckily, I don't know, but a court injunction said no. As long as these teams will uh, respect the rules for the Indy 500, legally they are allowed to participate. So at least a tentative has been done to try to organize under the same umbrella a championship together with USAC and CART teams organization, but unluckily it lasted in 1980 until half of the year, around July. Then they took separate ways and also, let's say, the fake IndyCar championship organized by USAC lasted really a couple of months. And at the end, the kart championship was the real IndyCar championship open wheel series. We finally arrive in the 90s, where for more than a decade, the kart championship has been the main, if only the unique, real open wheel series championship for US. The problem is that it was so powerful that the same team owners having the right to vote within the board were also the same people running winning teams and deciding which rules were right or wrong for the championship. And the names uh, historically are the, the likes of Penske, Pat Patrick, Haas and so on. The rest of the field obviously was not happy with this figure because at the end they paid millions of dollars to participate but without even the hope to win races or to be contenders for the championship unless uh, strange opportunities and strange scenarios were around. So the majority of wins and championship were all on Penske, Patrick, Newman, Haas, etc. So if you were uh, a lucky driver back then you raced for uh, these uh, three teams and you had, let's say, major opportunities and hopes to win something. And also we have to add that Roger Penske was also the owner and the major investor, let's say, of the most powerful engine available back then, that was the Chevrolet V8 Turbo, developed together with Ilmore Company, the same company that nowadays in you builds and manage the Mercedes F1 engines for the British-based Mercedes team with the label of being a German team. The other problem was that Roger Penske used exclusively almost his engine or he was in the condition to sell his engine just to few other teams. Guess who are the names, the previous I was mentioning before. So at that point the credibility of the sport was under threat because fields start and starting grids started to be reduced in number. For example, the, in the mid-90s, the famous Pocono 500 miles was held with 26 cars out of historical 33, like Indianapolis. But in general, non-winning teams were not happy to spend a lot of money to bring a lot of sponsors and not having the real possibility to win something. So at a certain point, the temperature goes up in the discussion and Mr. Tony George grandson of Tony Hooman, decided to have a sort of common table of discussion and of confrontation, asking CART organization to say, OK, why don't we sit at the same table with a pre-planned set of rules to be all, let's say, on the same page? Because anyway, the Indianapolis 500 still remains the most important race in our championship and USAC set of rules. Instead, the rest of the championship is made with similar cars, with similar set of rules, but we, we don't have a common trait, a common fil rouge keeping us together. The problem was the cart didn't reply in a sort of uh, good dialogue manners. And so Tony George at a certain point decided to took over in some way the responsibility of this uh, situation. Plus in the same period, cart owners were so 
selfish on thinking that they were the reason behind the popularity and the success of the Indy 500 that were, let's say, strong within their positions. And the main voice was the one of Roger Penske. But it was also true that the Indy 500 existed before Tony George, before Tony Hulman, before Roger Penske, Pat Patrick and Newman Haas. Since 1911, it was the most important race in US every year, together with the Daytona 500 for the NASCAR championship. It was also true that the Indianapolis 500 was a sort of a final point for all the subcategories, the feeder categories, as a sort of road to Indianapolis, because you could start to race in your oval dirt track close to your hometown, win, be part of a winning team, and go up in the categories, hopefully to reach one day the Indianapolis 500. It's also true that under the cart management, year by year, the IndyCar world started to become more a sort of Formula One in a sort of uh, American salsa, opening up to street circuits, road circuits, and especially extra US, in some way forgetting which were the roots of the IndyCar, so a complete season on ovals that is the pinnacle for all the previous categories you are raced within. Plus also, American drivers specialized in oval racing were more and more put aside because the need to have specialists for road and street circuits did call many ex-Formula 1 drivers or European drivers or South American drivers with experiences not only on oval or not at all on ovals and just coming from a more, let's say, European route race. And they were successful. Let's think about Mario Andretti, Nigel Mansell, Alex Zanardi, etc. So, like in a boxing match, we have two sides. The first one of Roger Penske, willing to keep the status quo that made his team one of the most winning historically and being also a voting director of the board of the cart. On the other side, Tony George, that was starting to understand that there were possibilities to think in a different way about IndyCar races and especially was the voice for the not happy teams racing back then in the kart championship. And so by 96 the match was on. Two figures, two important figures on the same ring fighting for the same reason. There is a particular precise moment when it happened and technically it happened on the 26th of May 1996, a day where, as historically always happened, there was the Indy 500 at Indianapolis Motor Speedway. But Kart, with Roger Penske also owning the Michigan Speedway, decided to put in the same date the US 500, while obviously while in the other part of the nation there was the Indianapolis 500. As an historic note, the Indy 500 and the IRL Championship, the Indy Racing League, was there not clashing with calendars with kart season. But at a certain point Roger Penske and his friends decided to put on the same date the US 500, claiming that with the kart championship at Michigan people could see the best drivers ever raced in US. The Indy 500 was saying we are the historic type of racing for open wheels series, why don't you come to see the most important race? There is also nice comedy behind it because the Indianapolis 500 started, was well under development the race and at a certain point uh, half race, half of the race let's say was uh, happening and the US 500 started, well tried to start because in the formation lap if I'm not wrong, 17 cars out of 33 crashed before even reaching the starting line and starting the race. So it was really absolutely something that even uh, George Lucas could not write down as a sort of script for this story. So let's go to see also why it happened. It's very simple because if we reduce the reason behind money, interests and power, we get the overall picture. 
and very often these three factors are, let's say, what generally move the world, in which way it happened. For US Racing Open Wheel Series there were two ways of thinking. The first one by Roger Penske, the second one by Tony George. The first one did want to keep the status quo, open up the category becoming a sort of Formula One Americana, also outside US, so having races in Europe, in Asia, in South America, etc. Tony George said, why do we have to get rid of our history? We can race just on ovals, be unique and be different to any Formula One, Formula 3000, Formula 3 or whatever. Plus, I think we can reduce the cost of the competition to allow feeder categories drivers to come to race the Indy 500 like it happened in the past. Before the next slide I must say thank you very much to the YouTube channel NASCAR Man History. It is beautiful, more than beautiful, a more than prepared, well prepared channel that did inspire me to tell this story also in English. Anyway, the idea behind Tony George and perfectly explained by NASCAR Man History channel back in 95-96 was why do we have to spend half a million of dollars each year just to participate to the kart championship considering then we don't have just a fixed cost but also something added like like the rebuilding of the engines after some races and the mandatory super speedway kit to be purchased because the car itself is not let's say perfectly fine-tuned with normal wings to race on ovals. Tony George, this time on the left, said we can purchase a chassis and an engine that can last all the season, be less expensive and allow more people, more drivers, more teams to participate because I think that with half of the expenses we can have a competitive racing environment. If we take these numbers coming from 96, 95, updated to our nowadays expenses in dollars still, it would mean that with $600,000 today we could participate to the IRL. Instead, we would need at least 1 million at least to participate in the kart championship. So let's say that with the same amount of money I can race two years straight in the Indy Racing League and instead with the same amount of money I can only participate one year in the kart championship. If we go back to the roots of uh, IndyCar world, we cannot hide the fact that the tradition of US racing has been held on these dirt paved and asphalt ovals, allowing tight races, allowing spectators to sit down in a sort of arena that allows you to see in every action of the race, regardless of the point where you sit in. And to be fair, all this oval racing was a sort of road to Indianapolis because you learn to run on ovals tagged with 30-40 cars around you and then you develop your skills as a team or as a driver to one day arrive to the pinnacle of US motorsport. So here there is a sort of contrast between history, roots and what was back then the reality of the everyday IndyCar series. So even before the previous split that was more, let's say, an economical situation in 79 between teams and USAC sanctioning body, here we are still having an economic matter on the plate, but also a sort of uh, historic uh, personality of the sport itself. So moving from ovals of the past to the more F1 themed similar championship and was not involving only tracks. It was involving also American drivers that were not, let's say, any more uh, suggested and first looked for possible uh, job in an IndyCar team because the need was not for more ovals but for more experienced street and road circuits drivers. There are two examples here. The first one is uh, Jeff Gordon that won basically everything in the feeder categories but had to switch to NASCAR because nobody in IndyCar wanted an expert on ovals. And the other case is about Tony Stewart that won first in history everything in the same year within feeder categories and then had to move into NASCAR 
if he wanted to compete at the maximum level, but luckily happened in this period and with the Indy Racing League he had the opportunity to be immediately at the top of the open wheel series. But so there was a sort of contradiction between history and back then what was everyday scenario for IndyCar. As an example, I can drop on the table that in the 95 calendar there were just six races on ovals out of 17 in total in the championship. Luckily, the Indy 500 was anyway the main event for that championship, but was quite strange to see a sort of historic oval themed category approach complete seasons more like a Formula One calendar than an American calendar. This amount of things running around caused a real versus fight between Kart, Roger Penske, and between Indy Racing League, Tony George. Let's go to see the development of this uh, fight. In 96 we had two calendars, one with 16 races that was the Kart Championship, with six on ovals, six on street circuits, four on road tracks. On the other side we had a sort of double season. The prologue one that you have seen on my channel with IndyCar Racing 2 lasted for three races at the beginning of 96 season. Then, in the second part of 96, we have seen a sort of uh, soccer league with uh, August and September first races, then restarting in January up to the end of 97 year, solar year. Here we can see two things. That despite all 13 races across two years, were on ovals, the Indianapolis in the 500 was there since ages and as said on the same date the kart organization put the US 500 at the Michigan International Speedway. But it's also true that between 16 and 13 races, 8 of them happened on 97 season from a solar year point of view. The rest was, uh, as said, a sort of prologue plus an anticipation of the next season. But anyway, this is what was uh, on the table. The 97 season of the cart, we will see then afterwards, was not dissimilar to the 96 one on the left. Then the evolution have seen uh, two calendars. On the left the cart that has between uh, 16 and 20 races up to the years 2000, while on the right the IRL gained races by races a more and more uh, presence on the calendar. Plus, as you can see on the left, the kart championship, the kart championship has started to reduce the number of races, while instead the IRL started to have more races with the, let's say, absurdity at the end, 2005, 6 and 7, of two to three races on road circuits and, unbelievable, one or two on street circuits. A sort of change in the balance of the calendar for both. I have also some notes to put on the table. The first one, the name. In 96, the kart championship was named IndyCar World Series. From the following year, it has become the kart championship properly without having anymore the rights to use the name Indy IndyCar in their organization. Plus, in 2004, it becomes the champ car, like it was at the beginning where everybody in the 50s called the champ car the IndyCar, if you remember, but the major point was that IRL of Tony George had every year the Indy 500 in the calendar. Plus, starting from year 2000, Chip Ganassi car team started to race also in the IRL and won the Indianapolis 500 with Juan Pablo Montoya. Year 2000, the following year, Montoya would have traveled to become an F1 driver. Plus, also many ex-CART IndyCar teams came to IRL around 2003, and not only teams, also drivers. And finally, in 2007, the last season for the Champ Car was, at that point, a sort of American Formula One with 14 races, zero on ovals, but at least we have seen an incredible domination by Sebastian Bourdet that won the last four championships straight becoming one of the most successful driver in US history. Let's go to the end, that is the grand finale for this story. From 2008, the champ car folded was not anymore neither a proper championship, neither a successful financial company that lost basically all the value that previously it had. And the demise of this championship has been absorbed by the IndyCar X IRL season and Tony George organization. But strangely enough, 
from 2019, the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, owned previously by the Hulman & Company, so basically the family of Tony George, has been sold to the Penske Corporation, but not only the track to Roger Penske, also the IndyCar series has been sold to Roger Penske. So yes, believe it or not, the two guys that were fighting for 25 years between ideas, economics, politics and blah blah blah, at a certain point have taken each other their right hand, shaked them very much and they have become the couple behind the nowadays IndyCar reality. Were they, let's say, before like these two guys, like dog and cat, like cat and mouse? Well, I don't know. At the end, I think they have worked to guarantee a florid future for the category that never reached the popularity of NASCAR, but at least must survive also for future generations. And so we arrive to what is today the IndyCar scenario. Today we will have an entity main sponsor IndyCar series, but as you can see in the logo there is still the silhouette of the IRL original logo. It has become a sort of uh, mid-90s championship scenario with 17 races, four of them are held on ovals and in particular in the month of May there is, yes at the end, the Indy 500 before the Labor Day as usual, but a few days before couple of weeks before, the same Indianapolis street circuit holds another race, another appointment of the calendar. So the only thing I can say is, if you developed a passion for American races, you are in good company with me, with myself, because thanks to NASCAR man history, thanks to what I did read on Italian magazines back in the 90s and more recently on the web, I've restarted to develop this passion for American US racing and I must admit I cannot wait to start the 96-97 IRL season on ovals to challenge myself on ovals after the tentative I did with the same prologue of the IRL 96 season raced some weeks before. I must also say that starting to study American racing traditions and American type of races I must admit I like it very much and despite being European and Italian, I cannot say, okay, it's just running around on an oval and that's easy. No, because the setup of the car requires some skills. I don't want to say it is a rocket science, but anyway, you have to study how the car moves around an oval at 300 km per hour in excess. And I must also say it's very tight and difficult to race for two hours running around with 33 cars around you, in front and behind. So for sure they are skills I must improve of myself. Plus there is an interesting comment when uh, happened to have a comparison between Formula 1 cars and IndyCar vehicles on the Cota circuit, circuit of the Americas. Because many people did laugh to the fact that the Formula 1 on that circuit runs almost 12-13 seconds faster than an IndyCar one. The fact is, with the current technology, IndyCar vehicles run at 350-370 km per hour on Indianapolis, Michigan. Super speedways are meant to develop this kind of uh, speeds as an average for two or three hours of race. And nowadays, possible crashes are almost fatal at that speed. So it's a compromise. An IndyCar vehicle can run, yes, slower than a Formula One on the same track, but develops then crazy speeds on ovals and super speedways. If the technology would be pushed at the same level of Formula One, it would be practically impossible to race on ovals because speeds would reach, I think, 400 km per hour, generating g-forces so high that maybe no humans could resist two hours in an IndyCar vehicle running constantly at 400 km per hour each lap. So as Europeans, maybe we should laugh less about US technology, just because it is meant to give a, a compromise between street racing and road racing together with oval racing, something that Formula One has not the need to have. And so Formula One can push the speed of cornering to the maybe maximum level, even if as you can see, 
endurance cars like the Porsche 919 Hybrid at Spa did smash the record of Formula 1. But let's say that for open wheel series it's not possible to have IndyCar vehicles performing like Formula 1 cars because they should stop them to race on ovals. So the story behind uh, these facts, it's easy as European with uh, habits in Formula 1 to laugh about ovals and technology on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean. But, but in reality there is the same passion, the same knowledge, the same uh, skills, the same will to win that we have here in Europe with Formula 1. So I can only wish you to enjoy NASCAR races, IndyCar races, because I think you will enjoy very much and have really a good time following these beautiful categories. That is true, they have different traditions from us, but they still offer an incredible amount of competition between ovals and street racing. So that being said, this is the story that I wanted to tell with a sort of prequel, a development and a nowadays situation and I hope in some way you have enjoyed this uh, storytelling. I must apologize for not being English mother tongue but I've tried to do it at my best because I want any way to continue to propose bilingual content for my deep love for English language but also to try to combine in some way two different uh, worlds, one with the English language that is the most used in the world together with Spanish language and, if you don't mind, my roots, that being Italian and being European, in some way I feel that my mind lives in between, in the Atlantic Ocean, between Europe racing motorsports tradition and US motorsport tradition that is hooking me up day by day more and more. So. From Marco, from Monza, that's all. Thank you very much for following me and for watching also this video. I hope in some way you did like and did enjoy in some way an hour of me telling something that maybe you knew or maybe not, but because it did drive my passion for uh, the things I do on my channel, I wanted to share it with you to justify also in some way the future contents I will place on my channel. So, as always, I hope to find you very well. Thank you very much again for watching, for dropping a comment, for clicking the like button or subscribing to my channel. Feel free to do it, it's free. And as always, stay home, stay safe, stay racing. Best wishes from Marco, from Monza, from Ikes Racing Channel. Ciao, see you very soon, bye bye.